Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests today are actor-singer Noel Harrison and photographer Veronique Vial. Veronique was born and raised in Paris. She studied fine arts and photography, but she's done two books on Cirque du Soleil. She's done two books on men and women, Women Before Ten and Men Before Ten. And did you always want to be a photographer? You did study photography. Yes, but I didn't want to be a photographer oh. earlier. <laughs> I studied mathematics and I was too bored. Is that right? How and did I, you get into this then? Then I met a photographer and I loved his lifestyle. So I thought I knew nothing about photography. I had no clue if I had an eye or a sense of composition. But I loved the idea of traveling and meeting anybody you want. So I went back home and told my dad I was going to quit math and tech. Did you, did, did you ever model? No. So, so you were never in front of a camera? No, no. I knew nothing about photography, nothing. But one thing that you mentioned that was interesting is you didn't know if you had the eye or the composition. What does that take? Uh, can a mathematician do that? Well, I guess you can do anything you want in life. <laughs> you just have to work hard enough at it and eventually you get it. Uh -huh. It took me a while. Huh? But, but, did you, but do you think that natural, that eye is natural or composition is natural? I think composition is natural and an eye is natural, but it, natural because it's been trained over the years. And my dad was a publisher, my mom is a painter, so I think oh. I think I grew up in, in that world of visual art. So when you decided to, to follow this photographer and like his lifestyle, what did did you assist him? Well first I just carried the bags because I didn't even know how to load the camera. <laughs> that was your assistant. <laughs> yeah, I was just carrying the bag. <laughs> then he taught me how to to load the camera and he even taught me how to use the camera. So that was a uh, hands-on experience. Yes, but then after I went back to school. After I went oh, to school. I see. I see. In France, we always believed you have to go to school to learn. No matter what. No matter what. <laughs> you always need a diploma to do whatever. Well, when you went back to school and you got out of school, did you start photographing then people? Then I realized I knew nothing. Oh, you <laughs> Then I started working and I learned. You really learn photographing people, I think, but doing do, mistakes. How do you start as a photographer? Do you just walk the streets and take pictures? Do you ask people to be? This is an option, but I think the best option is to decide of a subject you want to do. For example, uh, I decided to do the men before 10 a.m., so I decided I was going to go wake up celebrities waking up. So then you have a purpose, you have a mission. So every time you meet somebody important or interesting, you ask them if you could photograph them. And your work kind of follow the idea you have in your head. But that was uh, after you had... After I practiced. After you practiced. <laughs> How did you practice? <laughs> I practiced a, a lot on commercial jobs. I did a lot of um, campaign for advertisers. and. I see. So you've done also a lot of editorial. I do, com yeah, I do it editorial and commercial. What's the difference between editorial and commercial work? Commercial work is um, actually quite easy because the art director comes and tells you exactly what he wants. Ah. So you have to complete his vision. So does it really depend on what kind of an eye you have if you're doing well, that? Well, of course you put a bit of your eye and, and your soul in it, but is they still tell you exactly what they want. They're, I see, I see. And editorial, is that the no, same? No, editorial, it's different. You have more freedom. You, they give you a subject or a person to photograph and you pretty much interpret it the way you want. And so that's you, creative. Do you, do you write as well? When I do the book, I write a little bit. Do you? Yes, and I enjoy it more and more. So when you put a book together, it's not just the photography part of it. It used to be just the photography. My first book, Pam Houston did the writing. Ah. Because my publisher said you need a good writer, well, so the book makes sense. How do you find a publisher? Let's start there. 
that's very difficult. When I did the first book, I saw maybe 40 publishers in America, and they all say, oh, it's very beautiful, it's interesting, but you're nobody, kind of, you know. <laughs> but is that, that's the point, isn't it? I of mean, course. you have to say you worked with somebody or you've done something with somebody before they even talk to you. But you, eventually you get lucky. I met that woman, Cindy Black, at Beyond the World, and she was a really great woman. She, she had the vision. She realized the book could be great, so she gave me the chance. Is this one of the, is this, this something This is the second the book? book I did. Oh, this is, which book was this? This is Woman Before 10 a.m. Okay, so th this is something from that book. Woman Before 10 a.m. And by this time, you've become very well known. Yes, after so you, you do one book, you do all the TV shows, and after everybody wants to be in your book. And uh, all the publisher wants to do it. And they want so to do fun. it. I yeah. see. <laughs> Who influenced you in your photography? Um, I think my favorite is Duano. Duano and Brassai are my two favorite photographers. I love their street work. I love, in photography, what I love is to show what I feel. I don't really like to, to interpret. I like to steal what I, what I feel at that time. But is, is that just the subject matter? What about printing? Is it, well, the technical, part, technical the part is very part. important. I'm going to show this too. The technical part and f help you create your vision. You have to know your technical to get the right vision. So does that mean that the difference in the black and white or the difference in the color you use. You the choose, when you start, you choose, you choose the medium you're gonna, you, the you prefer. I love black and white because I find you don't get distracted by color, so you go straight to the emotion. But is black and white always real black and white? I mean, strong black and white? Are there different intensities? Well, you make it the way you want. That's what I mean. Do you yeah. have a, a signature for that? Yes, I like to make the black really black. Oh, yeah. You do? Yes. <laughs> like, I guess like, um, let's look at this. Yes, I think a black and white should have blacks and white. It makes it, uh, it creates the Tell emotions. us about this. How did you do this, set this up? Well, I didn't set up anything. When I arrive at Patrick, he says, I have an idea. Every morning I take, um, I don't know you call it, a <laughs> if you call it a but bath, a, a bird bird bath. bath. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, do you want to photograph it? I said, sure, let's photograph it. And so you just... So I went and photographed it. When, um, now that you have books and, you've, and you're well known, do you think it's important to have an art gallery then show your work? It's very important. It helps you, your art dealer helps you. It doesn't help you with your vision, but it helps you with the commercial part of your vision. Does you know? it? The so people can see your work whenever you, they want, they can have access to your books. Do so you it's very important. Do you think, and do you look at photography as fine art? Some people don't look at it as fine art. Depends what you do. I think those books are not fine art. I see, so there is a... I mean, A Woman Before Ten is definitely not fine art, but it's, it's a beautiful classic book, I think. The Cirque will be a little more fine art. I mean, it's something you can put on your wall. There's beautiful photographs inside. I have a picture, right, from that, yes, the, cover. the cover. I'll show you. How did you get involved with Cirque du Soleil? Because you've done uh, two books on Cirque du Soleil. I actually did three. Oh, three? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, how did, did you get books. involved with them? I met them uh, at one opening when they first arrived here in Los Angeles and we became friends. And I told them I would love to run away with them and do a book and started like that. Is that how it started? Mm -hmm. That is so great. So they, did they look at your work? Did they know that We grew they together. We, uh, we grew together. When they arrived here, they were just starting and I was starting in America and we evolved together and we were great friends. And oh, oh, oh. So, did you, did you just live there with them? I spent time with them, yes. You went to all the different, different cities? Different places where they pitched the tent, photographed backstage, on stage. What were some of the things? Did you want to run away and join the circus? Oh, that was the first idea. I, <laughs> I didn't run away, but I <laughs> almost ran away. Did you, did you practice with them or do any of the things that... Oh, it's fun. The artists, they always make you try everything. I do don't they? Know, I don't know if you see, they have a show where they had the... the Bungee, bungee cord, they made me try this. And when I photographed, they made me go on top of the circus tent so I can photograph from up, or for, you know, you photograph from every angle. And so they had some ideas of their own. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
And then how do you keep it fresh? How do you keep your photography fresh? I choose subjects who excite me. Things who excite me. It's a way to explore life. It's not a business, it's not a, a work. It's, I just live my life and, and photography come from, from that. There was an exhibit at the Getty recently on Atje. Mm -hmm. Atje, mm -hmm. is that how you say mm -hmm. it? And his photographs were so much of the street life of Paris. And it looked like you could look into his photographs and see the same thing today when you're there. And they were from the, I think, late 1800s. But Paris didn't change that much. Is it, oh, you think that? I don't but what think. about The clothes people? changed, but people didn't change that much. I don't think they changed that much. So do you think anyone could go in and do that? And it would work? Of course. Work? But you, you want to record your time anyway. So wherever you go, you record your time. But your children are going to think it's old. But in truth, the spirit was the same. My grandmother was younger than me in her mind. So I think it's all in, it's all about the soul, I think, what's inside. What, what are your future projects? Right now, I'm photographing a book called uh, Hollywood Splash, and it's movie star jumping in their pool. It's really funny. Uh -huh. It's really, really funny to do. How do you, do, how do you get them to do that? <laughs> you just ask them. <laughs> and they jump in their pool? <laughs> close on, close off? Anything, anything goes, with the dogs, with the, you know, the bicycle, anything. The kids, everything. Oh, that's so great. Well, we wish you a lot of luck in your career. Thank you so I, much. I don't think we need to worry about it anymore, <laughs> Veronique. Thank you for thank being you, with us today. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Noel Harrison. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with actor Noel Harrison. Actor, singer Noel Harrison is the son of Rex Harrison and Colette Thomas. Noel was born in London and brought up by his mother in what seems to be a very anti-mame type of existence. I never thought of it as anti-mame, <laughs> uh, uh, but I guess in a way it was. It yeah. sounded like it. It was... Um, it was more athletic oh. than, than anti man because my mother liked, liked to ski and uh, things oh, like that. Oh, like yeah. that. You know, oh, yeah. I see, I, mean, it, I see. It wasn't, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't like big city sophistication. Was I mean, she French? No, she had French blood. Um, and she had a lot of uh, uh, French attitudes and uh, French appreciation of life. Well, I want to go back and say that your career actually started in the 50s and 60s as a cabaret singer. And uh, you were... Uh, in fabulous clubs like the Hungry Eye in San Francisco, Mr. Kelly's um, in Chicago, and the Persian Room in the, in the uh, Plaza Hotel. Uh -huh, yeah. And then, um, as you started singing, were you singing your own work? No, no, I never wrote a song until the, the probably the late 60s I wrote my first song. Oh. Oh, is that what yeah, happened? Yeah, it just came to me out of the blue, too. Then when you were appearing at these places, what, how, whose work were you singing and what kind of show did you have? Well, you see, I'd been a... I'd been a um, the, first, the first job I had, really, was... Uh, no, I was in theatre for a short while when I was 17. And then um, I was in, did my military service for two years. When I came out, I, I could play guitar a little bit, so I got a job playing and singing in a, a coffee bar in London and uh, gradually sort of developed, graduated into, into cabaret. So basically my material was, um, I've always done French popular music. That's why I asked um, if your mother was French, because yeah. your French uh, is great. I heard you sing the other night in French, and it, I mean, you could have fooled me. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, you just studied it. <laughs> well, I just, I grew up loving French language because of my mother, and, and I, um, when I first started listening to French music, it was Charles Trenet and Edith Piaf. And um, to me, having been brought up on sort of English Tin Pan Alley and American Tin Pan Alley, and uh, at the same time having an education in literature and poetry, I, I've, I always thought the, the English and American lyrics were rather lame and, and banal. And all of a sudden, I started listening to Trenet and Piaf and these, the poetry in the French songs 
was, was unsurpassed, and I just fell completely in love with it. Don't you think that it's the accent and the pathos that they deliver it in? Are no. the words lame, the same no, as they're not. No, they're not. No, they are. It, it is incredible <laughs> poetry. I mean, um, I, I wish I could come up with a quick example for you. Um, but uh, you want to talk while I think? Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to talk about where you were living at this time when you were doing all the cabaret. Well, initially I was living in Europe, in, in Switzerland. My mother moved oh. to Switzerland when I was 14. Um, and I started doing cabaret and I took my guitar mm -hmm. and traveled around Europe. And then I started, I went back to London where I was born to live and there I did cabaret there for about 10 oh, years. Oh, you did. And then when yeah. you came to America? So I was already an established cabaret performer and I came here as a cabaret performer and I played in New York and, uh, and uh, as, as you said, the other various places and I had a record in, in the top 40 at the time. Did you, did you actually <laughs> want to be a singer? Or an actor? No, I always, I, I always liked singing and playing. I didn't, oh, I, you did? I, yeah. My little stint in the theatre when I was 17 kind of put me off acting. I didn't really like the... the um, I, didn't, I, oh, I didn't like it very much. And then I, I sort of fell into it again because of, um, because of having the success with the cabaret and, the, and oh. the Top 40 record. And I was on the Johnny Carson show in 1964 or 5. And... Um, the producers of The Girl from Uncle, which is the spin off from The Man from Uncle, that's this famous. The, yeah, uh, that's what I was going to ask you how yeah. you got into that, just by guest appearing on yeah, the show? Yeah, on the Johnny Carson show. And I guess they're sitting at home and said, uh, hey, that guy looks like the right guy. And, uh, and then what did you do on that show? In the, on The Girl from just Uncle? Just totally acting? Yeah, yeah. I played, <laughs> so there I, you were. You, you remember The Man from Uncle? Uh huh. You, you, yeah, I mean, Robert I know you're scarcely old enough no, to remember Robert that. Vaughan and, um, but, yeah, Robert Vaughn and... Yeah, Robert Vaughn and David McCallum. Yeah. David McCallum. Yeah, and then Stephanie Powers was the girl from Uncle, and I was the girl from Uncle's sidekick, uh, whose name was Mark Slate. Um, and uh, I don't know, I had a lot of success. I don't know, ran for a season, you know, and I became a celebrity. And, did they uh, keep rerunning it? Uh, yeah, they did for a while, yeah. Well, did you yeah. get to sing as uh, the sidekick? No, 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 <laughs> no not at all. <laughs> no, that was one, and at the same time, because of the records, I had another uh, Top 40 record, and, and um, so I did all the variety shows. I was on the... the because of the top record you had, what was it, Suzanne? Su yeah, How does a that young go? girl was the first one. Uh, you want me to sing? You, you told me not to bring my guitar. Oh, I didn't want Suzanne to. Suzanne takes you down to a place near the river. You can hear the boats go by. You can stay the night beside her. That's poetry. I got it. I Leonard got it. Cohen. I remember the song yeah. now because I couldn't remember it. And then, um, what was the first one that was on the top? A one? young girl, which was um, it was quite notorious because it was about this young sixteen-year-old girl who ran off with an artist and ended up dead. And the last line of the song was dead. And it was a Charles Aznavour song, in fact. Oh, so um, there you so are, back to that haunting. Well, I never Melodious. left it. I never left it. I always sought the poetry in in uh, But that's what made music. that's what made you, or, or maybe it made it easy for you because you loved it so much, and you succeeded. I mean, to have three top two, top forty yeah. tunes. Uh, yeah, because the windmills of your mind, which was the, actually the most successful, um, which was the uh, theme song on the Thomas Crown Affair, the original Thomas. That Crown was Affair. nominated in 1968 as it won. A, the oh, Academy it won for the best song. Yeah. In 1968, and yeah. you sang it. Yeah. Did you get to sing it on the award show? No, I was making <coughs> a movie in England, and the producer was a real jerk and wouldn't let me come back and do it. Um, he wanted me to stay, you know, it had only taken a couple of days. On the other hand, given the way I was in those days, I probably would have sung wrong notes. And no, if you sang it, how would you, like... <laughs> well, you get to do it over and over again in the studio. Say it, right? sing it, sing it, sing ah. it. <laughs> Just a cappella oh singing. Round, like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning, on an ever spinning reel, where is my guitar? <laughs> <laughs> No, it just uh, just the melody is yeah, so great, melody. and yeah. then I think um, you you dropped out in the I 70s. Did. That was 1968. Here was the song that was played all over. Your voice, I mean, great voice on that. Then you dropped out. Why did you drop yeah. out? Because um, I couldn't. I'd lost my my um, I'd lost my anonymity. Oh. I couldn't. I mean, because of not just from the girl from uncle and the songs but i was on every single variety show i was on every single talk show you know i was just a hot property <laughs> and as they called it and um i didn't like 
I like to look at people. I like to be anonymous, you know, and uh, I, I couldn't do that anymore. So I just, I just decided to go and do something else and go back to my musical career. And I went, ended up buying a farm in Nova Scotia and, and, um, and uh, living there and, and playing folk festivals and, you know. But you really hadn't given up, had you? You were still singing, you were doing bluegrass. Oh, it wasn't a question of giving up um, being an artist or being a performer. It was a question of giving up celebrity. Oh, I as see. A, as, <laughs> because it became, that's what I became, a celebrity. And so people thought that I was merely making records because I'd been on a TV series. Which was not true. They still you'd some people still think that. that. You'd started that way. I'd been a, I'd been a uh, cabaret entertainer and musician that's for twelve years before I ever did. Yeah, uh, that's what I mean. TV. But yeah. then when you were in Nova Scotia, you were still doing something for CBS. You were you kept your well, no CBC. Thing. That was oh, Canadian CBC. Broadcasting Corporation. I did a I did a uh, show that I devised myself, which was a half hour show about uh, singers, musicians, and songwriters, and it was called Take Time. Yeah. I was quite proud of it. <laughs> the other, what, then in, by the 80s you were ready to come back and sing, and I know Travis Holder, who's a critic for one of our entertainment newspapers, said that your Jacques Brel review was one of the greatest things he had ever seen. Well, he gave me the most wonderfully warm and generous review. And, and how yeah. did you did, put that together? Well, um, Jacques Brel was one of the people, I mean, I saw Jacques Brel when he was, his career was just beginning to, to flower in the 60s, long before the show Jacques Brel is Alive and Well. And uh, I loved his stuff the same way I loved all the French stuff. And then um, much later when I thought I wanted to do a one-man show, I thought I would do it about him. And then I started to research his life and see what happened to him. And you know, he died young, uh, he died at 49. No. He retired at, at the peak of his career when he was 38. He'd stopped doing concerts because he said he didn't like being commercialized. And I identified so strongly, but he didn't like being a celebrity. So in that sense, he liked his music and um, he felt it was being destroyed. And then he became an actor and uh, directed a couple of movies, wrote a couple of movies, continued recording, then sailed away, um, sailed off around the world and ended up in the Marquesas and uh, lived there and uh, got lung cancer and died at 49. But then what did you do when you did the review? Did you sing just his songs? Yes, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> yes, no. Um, I sang <laughs> his songs in the... <laughs> eh. um, I sang his songs in, in the original French and Flemish, some of it. And um, I also sang a song that I had written, um, which was kind of about his life and my life. And I also sang a, a Hank Williams song. Oh, you um, did? Yeah. You put that all together in, for this review? What was it It's called? not a review. It's a one-man show. Oh, um, it was I see. it was called Adieu Jacques, and it was about his life and death, oh, and about his poetry. I see. And so, his what kind of Hank Williams song would you sing? It was uh, Love Sick Blues. Oh, yeah, that's great. And, and it was just because I was relating his celebrity in France to Hank Williams' celebrity here, and it was a very oh, similar kind of yeah, you know, because because it's Americans usually don't fully understand what kind of. Uh, a success Jack Brel had and what he meant, what he still means to French people. You still sing some of those songs, don't you? Oh, yeah, the yeah. Jack I'm going to do the show again, in fact, in, oh, in September. Oh, Oh, great. In Northern California. You start, then it'll just start going everywhere. No, what? it doesn't. It's, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's it a funny thing. It doesn't do that? It, uh, no, I've had the most incredible reviews. I've done it in London, Montreal, here, all over the country. Um, it never draws a crowd. You know why I think? Because what it sounds like is Aging English actor sings songs in French by dead Belgian. I don't think people know that. They have to hear the music. <laughs> <laughs> they they no. can't say that. I mean that. that the, because, because people here know Brel's work more from the, the review Jacques Brel is Alive and Well right. than they do from Brel himself. Did they and sing? They sang his songs. They sang translations of his songs, right. which are wonderful in their own right, but which are, which are not. Um, and then when you sing them, you sing them in French, yeah, obviously. Yeah, because the translations most of the time don't completely do justice to, you know, it's very hard to translate French. So in the 80s you went back on the stage, you did Camelot, Man from La Mancha, My Fair Lady. Oh yeah, but I, I was doing that all along. <laughs> Were you and, doing you know, it all along? Yeah, I mean like once a year or so I would get one of those shows to do and that would like uh, make me enough money to be a singer for the rest of the year. But to play, <laughs> but to play Professor Higgins, your father's role, yeah. did, did 
Did you feel daunt like it daunted? Was daunting? I should say <laughs> <laughs> the first um, the first time I did it, and uh, it was in a dinner theater, a big dinner theater outside Boston, and it was uh, almost thirty years ago now. And uh, my father, you know, I asked my father what he thought. He said, "I said I'm, I've got been offered this job. I just had these uh, twins that were uh, just a couple of weeks old. Do you have I needed the money. Yeah, I have you? twins too. Yeah. Yes, mine are a boy and a girl. Are yours? Mine are twins, identical, identical girls. Oh my. <laughs> so, what uh, did your dad say? He said, "Why not? Everybody else is doing it." Oh, so why shouldn't <laughs> you know? I mean, that. But what about the critics? Did they compare you? Did they? Of course, yeah. Did they and, bug and, you? Um, no, they were usually they they were always quite nice to me, even from the beginning, and I've I've probably done twenty productions of it over over the thirty years. Oh, um, you have done a lot. Yeah. And then the other roles, your father didn't play in any of those other roles. No, did he? no. So uh -uh. you just created. The, I mean, you. Yeah, sang. I mean, I I I did my Fair Lady because I got offered a lot of money to do it, <laughs> and uh, I needed the money because I had these kids. You yes. Know? So, um, and. Uh, I love Camelot. I love playing Arthur in Camelot. That's my probably my favorite role, except uh, maybe Don Quixote, uh, Cervantes, and Man of La Mancha. That's love pretty that. wonderful. Ah. Love those yeah. all. But you were you've been acting again. You were in a Jagla movie, Deja Vu, yeah. which I saw, and yeah. I interviewed that girl, the French girl who was in it, and Henry at one time. So yeah. um, that keeps you back on the screen. Little independent yeah. movies. Absolutely, yes. I did another little independent movie called China Basin, um, directed by a friend of mine called Norman Gerard, and that was in this uh, little uh, Santa Monica, um, the, the Santa Monica Fest Film Festival uh -huh. last Fest year, and they uh -huh. said, but we, we can't consider it for an award because it's got a star in it. Oh. I said, give me a break. I mean, what's the way? Oh, <laughs> Where's my it. star salary? I love and, it. I yeah. have the star here, but my star the other night, Noel Harrison, said, I'm going to be a troubadour again. The troubadour is coming out in me. Yeah. Is that yeah, you? Absolutely. That's it. Absolutely. The troubadour and the writer. And, you know, acting jobs, I'll take them. <laughs> but I. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you were with us. And I'm sorry I didn't let you bring your guitar, but we heard your voice anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today, Noel. Oh, thank you. And thank you for being with us on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to us at 777 South Figueroa. 40th floor, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.